say our prayer. Um, are there people here who've not been here before who would like to meet you? So please, if you're here, I think please you. stand and oh. Douglas, I attend UPC, and I'm just terribly grateful for the work that you're doing. Maria Trevino, and I work for Justice for Our Neighbors, and I'm so glad to be here and get to meet everybody. Dr. Carlos Valadez, Holy Trinity Presbyterian Church, and I'm here exploring. Thank you. <coughs> Any new folks in this group? Any other? Oh. I'll come meet you. <laughs> I'll come halfway. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Derek Planting, and I'm with UTSA Social Work. Hi, I'm Jessica Brown, and I've been a less active UU member recently. My three kids keep me busy, but I work at Trinity, and uh, I have a background in immigration studies, my master's degree, so it should close my heart. Hello, I'm Tatiana Hecker, and I'm with the Episcopal Diocese of West Texas, along with those two lovely ladies, and I work in uh, World Missions, and so we already have a lot of initiative working um, with the surrounding immigration, um, not only in the border area, but also in Honduras and Mexico and Guatemala. And so we wanted to see how we can better connect with what's going on here. Okay, is there anyone else? I'll just add a name of Mike. I'm Mike Monroe. Do. Um, you do. You do. <laughs> I'm Mike Monroe. I'm from here at First Pres. Um, I've been before, but it's been a while. I'm just kind of recommitting to the effort. And he is the, the husband of Mary Claire, who does lots of work for us. So, I mean, it's nice to be introduced as the husband of someone. <laughs> I'm Ann Schaefer, and I'm here with my friend Robin Beresford. We're from Fredericksburg, and we would like to create a, a, a connection in Fredericksburg, and already I have a couple of churches that are gathering things for the interfaith. <coughs> Uh, welcome Coalition's Backpacks. Okay, okay. Okay. No, I'm trying to volunteer for this group, and I haven't got any answers to my... Okay, I welcome all of you who are here, those who have been here many times before, and those who are new. Thank you for joining us and being with us this day. Um, two of, uh, oh, one more thing, go ahead. Just a minute. Um, two of our leadership group are going to be um, responsible for our prayer today, but I want you all to know that if you have a prayer that you would like to say, please email either me or Mary Grace, and we will put you on the agenda because we would like to have other people uh, say prayers as well. Terry's going to do the slides for me. <clears throat> on March 30th, several of us went to Crystal City to the site of the concentration camp where Japanese Americans and others from many countries were held from 1943 to 1948. We met with seven of the detainees and many of their descendants who came on a pilgrimage to protest the repeating of history with our immigrants today. Sister Denise was invited along with the Buddhist priest from California. We had a better picture of her, but we didn't have the picture of the priest with her, so. Uh, <laughs> we also went with these pilgrims to the Dili, con the Dili concentration camp to protest. 
Our prayer is words addressed to the detainees in Dili by a Japanese descendant, followed by the drums that they used to talk to the Dili detainees. This picture and the drum video are taken by Norma Martinez with Texas Public Radio. Her post is linked on our tiny CC site. They will be coming back in November second on November second. Plan to go. It was powerful. <coughs> Today, we have asked the Taiko players of the United States to come here, and they have sent representatives from across the country. And right now, we are going to signal to the families and to the world that we are here to fight for you. Our message is families and children, take heart. Take heart. We have not forgotten you. We think of you every day. We are fighting for you here, and we are fighting for you back home. And every one of us who is here today, we represent hundreds and thousands of people who are fighting. And we will come back, and we will bring more people. And today, we have asked the type of player.
referring to the introduction of she. Uh, Olga Kaufman is well known to all of us. She's been attending our meetings for quite some time, but she is our guest speaker today. Uh, and she is representing Reform Immigration for Texas Alliance. Rita, right? Rita. Please come forward, Olga. Okay. talk a little bit about RITA. It's, uh, RITA is, uh, stands for Reform Immigration for Texas Alliance, or La Alianza de Texas por una Reforma Migratoria. Uh, and we uh, consider ourselves the voice of immigrant and border communities, but we also work with communities in Houston and Dallas, Lubbock. So really, we really are uh, a statewide organization. Now, <clears throat> So like I said, we're an alliance of, of community-based organizations and we were formed in 2009 to protect and advance the rights of immigrant communities in Texas. Uh, we have allies in business, religious, and law enforcement sectors throughout Texas. And it is a project of the Border Network for Human Rights out of El Paso. So you could say that our, our uh, center of or our, our headquarters are in El Paso. We have uh, our goals are to connect Texas communities to share struggles, hopes, and successes, to build capacity with the, within the immigrant community to engage and impact the immigrant immigration debate, to share strategies and resources to educate Texans on comprehensive immigration reform, and to impact state and national policy in, in immigration through collaboration with local, regional, and national stakeholders. So we do work at the state and the national level. Uh, our, stru our structure is uh, community-based. We have a, an executive committee composed of organizations representing diverse regions from across Texas. And the executive committee decides and implements priorities. Uh, <clears throat> and, and sets the agenda. And usually this is done every two years because we do a lot of work at the Texas legislature. And I think that's one of the reasons Rita was founded was to, once all the anti-immigrant bills started coming out or moving east from Arizona, uh, I think that that's when this organization was formed. And the Border Network for Human Rights facilitates and coordinates the Rita process so uh, they really do make sure that we we have some funding and are able to to convene at least uh, at least every year to to plan and coordinate our actions for the state uh, state liege and also in Washington um, here are a list of the community uh, executive committee members representing different organizations um, I think I'm the only one that's just a person because I don't really have uh, an organ. An, I mean, immigration is my passion, but I don't really have an, an organization that I work for or represent. So, I would really like for maybe the Interfaith Welcome Coalition to join our executive committee. And most of the organizations that are on the executive committee have more than one person, so they all kind of take turns. Uh, joining the meetings or, or setting the word out and it's it's a really good uh, it's a really good a format so that not just one person is stuck with all the the Rita jobs that come up. So I'm here mainly to invite you guys to to join our executive committee and help us uh, continue planning uh, our strategies for for our statewide immigration work. Uh, here's a list of participating organizations, and we do have some from San Antonio. Maldef has always been very uh, active. We have Raices, and then of course we have Texas Organizing Project from, from San Antonio. So, so we do have a lot of organizations that work with us and, and uh, provide information. Uh, we, we have a conference call uh, every two weeks, and then we try to have at least one summit 
somewhere in the state at least once a year so everybody can connect and plan some actions uh, and, uh, and get things going, ex especially right before the state legislature or during the legislative session. <clears throat> our, strategies, <clears throat> our strategies are to build grassroots power through community organizing, leadership building, and to engage immigrant communities in, a, in our organizations. And we do have a lot of immigrants and uh, DACA students that, that work with, with Rita. Uh, we build relationships with key and diverse allies, including business, law enforcement, and faith organizations. And uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. So Rita was started in 2009. Uh, that was before I came along. But its main goal was to share right to share human rights committee model with grassroots organization to build community capacity, and they stu still do that a lot, especially in West Texas. They do uh, voter registration, engagement, and and turnout, and and started building a narrative to combat anti-immigrant uh, policies. In 2011. Uh, was really when I joined Rita, and so I participated in a lot of the planning of some of the marches and actions that we did in Austin. And uh, 2011 was a great year. Uh, I'm sorry to say not anymore, but that was when we had SB9, uh, the anti-sanctuary cities bill, and it was defeated twice by a coalition that included Rita in the regular session and a special session. And the key elements that, used, that were used to defeat this uh, anti-immigrant <clears throat> law was the message came beyond immigration. It included uh, the Texas Business Association, and we pointed out how this anti-immigrant policies were gonna, and laws were going to affect the economy in Texas. And we had the Texas Business Association join with us. We had Hispanic evangelicals, which were, which are still today are a very strong partner with, with Rita because they do work a lot with immigrant communities, and that's that's who they they minister to, and that's that's their their flock. And then individual communities like in San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, all throughout uh, the valley, all throughout the state. So uh, in 2017, we started the bringing Texas together. Uh, motto to uh, promote dignity, respect, and rights for all. And this is some of the actions that we did in in uh, in 2017 during that legislative session. We did law enforcement panels. We we did a day of action in Austin. Uh, we mobilized for House and Senate hearings, and and we made a lot of individual visits to state senators and state legislatures. And we had um, press conferences on economic impact of SB4. And then we did, uh, in 2018, we did a Together or Juntos caravan. And that was a bus caravan from March 30th to April 12th that went to different parts of Texas. Um, they did not come through San Antonio, but that is being planned for 2019. So that's one of the, the the projects that we're working on this year is getting the second part of the, of the or caravan part two going. Uh, and there's some uh, <coughs> links to the articles that, that, were, that came out about the caravan. Moving forward, as I mentioned, we want to do the Texas Together caravan to the interior of Texas, so we would like to, to go uh, we missed uh, Lubbock and then moved to San Antonio, Austin, all that area, Hill Country, etc. <clears throat> uh, we want to build a, a, a stronger community agenda, and uh, we did have a, a statewide meeting this year, and it was in San Antonio at the Raices office, and I was really glad that some of the Interfaith Welcome Coalition people came because they helped us set the, the agenda for, for the next legislative session. And we did have an action in um, in Austin on March 14th, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go. I was, I was at a conference for, for my work, the one that pays my bills. Uh, so I, I was really sad. That's the first one that I've ever missed. Uh, we're trying to engage Asian, Black, Brown immigrant partnerships, 
And then we want to continue building our relationships with our law enforcement and the business and faith organizations, which I think we, we have strong relationships with some of them, but not all of them throughout the state. And we're in the process of leadership building of within the immigrant communities. And uh, so our my my purpose here, I, I think I mentioned before, will you please join us? Uh, become a part of RIDA. I would like to see the Interfaith Welcome Coalition become part of the executive committee since this organization touches all different issues within the immigration. The backpacks, you know, the 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 help at, at the detention facilities, accompanying uh, people to court hearings, all uh, you do tremendous work and I think we would like to hear more about it, learn about it, so that other communities can also become engaged in this area. Uh, you can also join our Action Network, and it's um, we're on Facebook, so that's one way. And we have a Twitter account at Texas Rita. And help us implement the human rights model in immigrant communities. Uh, we have, uh, and we need more allies, help us get more, build more allies. We have a conference, a statewide conference call every two weeks, like I said, and we plan whatever is, is uh, we, we get a, a report from a lot of our partners. Small Diff always gives us the legislative report because they're like on the ground there. We, we gave uh, reports from Houston, Dallas, what's happening in their area. And then we plan. Uh, right now we're in the process of, of doing the work that needs to be done in the legislature, but we're also planning a, a statewide summit. We like to have a statewide summit every year right after the legislative session. So we're planning one in June, and I would like to see it in San Antonio. So uh, I'm lobbying for that, but I need some of y'all's help. So if you wanna, if you, if you wanna talk about uh, joining um, the executive committee of Rita, uh, I hope that you, you decide to do so. And then if you have any questions, I'm here today to answer any that you may have, or I'll try. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes. I'm just wondering if Rita is working on any particular bills that we should be aware of. Uh, yeah, there's several, and I think most of the ones that we've gone over in the in the uh, social action committee, advocacy committee. We're and and Maldiv keeps up keeps us informed of all of those. So yeah, we are. And uh, I did go to the March 14th uh, day day on the hill, but I know they had a long list of the the, the bills that they were going to look that they were looking at and who they were going to talk to. Yeah, but your list looks very similar to our list, so. Thank you so much, Olga, and I did make a note so we can look that over at the at our leadership group and uh, decide if that's the right thing for us to have that stronger connection between Rita and IWC. Um, looking at our ministry reports, maybe this is appropriate to step right into advocacy after Rita's talk. Sister Pat, do you... Want to update us? Actually, Matt is going to get through. Oh, right. wonderful. Matt Lohmeyer. He's as tall as me, so I'll move. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, hold me to what we talked about so that I don't drift off. Uh, we are. The Advocacy Committee is um, in observing what's happening in Austin, what's not happening in Austin. Uh, we've kind of taken a position that we want to recommend that the members of the Interfaith Welcome Coalition focus on bills that impact uh, children, in particular bills that impact regulation of detention centers, uh, licensing for people who can't get on the grounds of schools uh, because they don't have license and insurance and, and just some of the most absurd 
things that one would think common sense would dictate, but, um, but it does not. Um, so I'm going to read kind of a proposition we have. We're going to send this information to all who are on the listserv for, with, with the approval of the, the group. Um, I'm going to have to make it larger. Oh, I can read that. So it begins, um, the following bills at first reading seek to enhance the well-being of unaccompanied children who cross the border alone and those separated from their families. They attempt to infuse common decency into the care of detained immigrant children in government custody who are being traumatized by this experience. Simple measures like monitoring and basic demographic information about these children, investigating when they report abuse, allowing them to contact their parents slash guardians, and not detaining them for longer than necessary to facilitate a suitable placement should be supported by all Texans slash American citizens, especially those who share our faith in God as the source of all creation. We ask all people of faith and goodwill to conduct to contact your legislators and encourage their support of the following House bills. And so what we're intending to do is to make this available in some format online, but then to send it to the membership with information that will include, you know, how to find out who your legislator is, if that's an issue that you yet need to resolve, um, who the chair of the particular committee where that bill is resting, hopefully not dying, uh, currently, who, and so our recommendation is that you will contact both your representative and the chair of the committee and sort of put the pressure that this is uh, a bill of concern because it impacts the well-being of children and children should be our highest priority, especially as people of faith. Um, we will also be drafting a letter to um, media here in San Antonio, but I think we're probably gonna expand that to beyond San Antonio, that will coincide with this effort to really emphasize that there is an opportunity for the Texas legislature to pass bills that will safeguard the well-being of children. It's not happening. We need this to happen. We had a discussion in our meeting that you know some of the bills, it'll be banging our head against the wall trying to get them to move, but some bills it's worth a little bit of a bruise on your forehead. Um, so that's what we're emphasizing. Did I miss anything in a report? Okay. Uh, all right, great. So look for that in your email. Please respond to it. Please take this opportunity. The session ends at the end of May. So there's a short time left to, uh, to make that impact. And um, we will hopefully get that out to you before, uh, before the end of, I'll say next week, because this week is rapidly eroding. Um, what's that? This week, they need to stress the fact that and oh, <clears throat> right. Um, so some of our local representatives, uh, Diego Bernal, uh, Meneris, they are some of the authors of some of these bills. So that gives you a real opportunity to, to say, is it something you want us to get alongside you and to help push? Um, because after all, we have a, a particular niche uh, and we should exercise that and leverage that every way we can. Okay. Anything else? Yes. yes. Is the committee paying any focus on the need to recruit parents for those children to help the department, the social services, as an example? They're historically saying how you have never had sufficient homes or facilities to house youngsters. And I was just wondering if you're focusing on that part of the problem. So I'll try and repeat what you asked so everybody understands. Um, is our committee focusing anything on expanding capacity of placement sites? Would that be a fair way? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we are not. Um, I don't think that means we can't. Uh, but I think... Who is? Yeah, I think that's that's research that has yet to be done. Um, obviously, capacity is an issue in so many different dimensions of this, but 
yeah, asking for children not to be detained and then not having a place for them to go does create kind of a quandary. Of course, not detaining them in the first place might be the solution. But, um, but yeah, I think that's a, a worthwhile added um, dimension to this that we have to pay attention to. So thank you. We will put that on our agenda. Did you get that down, Sister Pat? Yeah, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Anybody? Any other questions? Hope Spears anxieties. <coughs> no. Okay. Fears and anxieties. <laughs> hopes. Let's have some hopes. Uh, faith community involvement. Um, I would just like to announce a, a word of gratitude to Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, which has recently uh, been hosting us in airport backpacks and supplies. And they have just, thank you. <laughs> They have also just formed a committee to uh, assemble the backpacks for us, and it's going to be meeting for the first time this week. So yes, it can get out of my dining room. <laughs> I'm glad of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, collaboration committee. Oh, just a minute. Oh. I think we should truly uh, thank Travis Park. Oh, and Travis Park. Oh my God. Without all of you, so it takes all of us, right? We can do it without a place. <laughs> I just could not. Thank None you. of us could. Thank you. Thank you. Collaboration, yes. So do people know what Travis Park has been doing? We will it's been we'll, we'll, to do it. Okay. We'll have a more elaborate report. We, I know we're all just curious uh, as we can be and with many, many questions about the bus station and the bus station area and all that's going on there. So um, it's a little out of order, but it's coming right up soon. Anything from collaboration? Is it still current up here? Oh, yes, our, our volunteer appreciation dinner at Laurel Heights United Methodist Church, and that's another community um, faith community involvement that's <laughs> greatly appreciated. So <clears throat> mark that on your calendar. We'll be sending out uh, invitations uh, in early May, late April or early May. Okay. Okay. Fundraising, do we want to say anything about fundraising? Okay, then, now you, sister Susan, now we're getting into news. <laughs> Good morning, Sister Susan Mika I'm with the Benedictine Sisters. And uh, our uh, two of my helpers are here today, Nina, raise your hand, and Ruben in the back there. And uh, as part of our membership in the Interfaith Welcome Coalition, we try to put together the articles, the news articles, and we're following the court cases. So if anyone doesn't have a copy, um, maybe you can raise your hand and we can still try to see uh, if we can get you a copy. I think we have enough there. So um, in, in our monasteries in Bernie, I always just add that just for perspective. Um, so this time I put some of the articles at the beginning and um, what we try to do is go through uh, the various newspapers that we have subscriptions to and document these things for all of us and um, I would appreciate too if any of you are using this in certain ways I've been writing down as people are speaking some of the different things that they're saying and if you're using our materials in a specific way we would love to know about it uh, earlier in the year, we were able to secure a, a, a grant from the Conrad Hilton Fund for Sisters of $18,000 for the backpacks. And so now we have to, uh, you know, say what, um, you know, how were you, how are we documenting all of these kinds of things? I mean, we gave the 18000 straight to our treasurer here, and uh, that helped like minimally in a way, but for 1,575 backpacks. But, you know, of course, in the, <laughs> in the whole, um, it's a sliver, but it's uh, what we can do. 
So, as you know, the news has gone off the rails with uh, all of the articles that are happening just in the last few days. And of course, the minute we publish this, it's out of date, but we do our best. So, um, so just to lift up, you know, some of the different kinds of things, this migrant surge, I think uh, they just published the numbers, I think it was 103,000 that came uh, across in March. Um, we documented here about the Carnes uh, facility uh, holding women now, and I think we heard on the call, we're, we also participate in that family detention call every two weeks, that the numbers are very low. But uh, Carnes now went over to being with women instead of the way that it had been, uh, with originally with women and children, and then men and children, and now just back to single women. So. And then that article there, 100, oh, 108,500 undocumented, released in the last three months. Um, then just uh, some of the articles of Brownsville, the San Antonio situation on the next page, and we tried to document about the city, thank you, <laughs> you know, with all of the different things, as we're saying, everybody has their piece that they're trying to do, and Catholic Charities, many, much of this has been on the news here in our area. I know some of you are from out of town, and uh, you may have not have seen all of those different stories, but our newspaper really has picked this up quite a bit. It's been on the front page and, uh, you know, subsequent stories. And then the next page, this uh, Eagle Pass uh, bus company that had been charging migrants very steep fares. Uh, $75 instead of their usual $25 to be transported from Eagle Pass up here to San Antonio. And then uh, the next article there, the next day in our paper, the city called on that Aguila Express company to stop overcharging. And so then it seemed like they started also using another uh, bus company. So anyway, so like we just see our ministry here is documenting just you know, saying uh, this is what is going on and thank you to the city for raising those questions on all of our behalves. Family separations, um, th this is just like startling, startling. Um, uh, it says the Justice Department said in a court filing late Friday, April the 5th, that it will take at least a year to review about 47,000 cases of unaccompanied children taken into government custody between July 1, 2017 and June 25, 2018, the day before the U.S. Judge Dana Sabra halted the general practice of splitting families. And then he ordered uh, that those children in government care had to be reunited with their families. And I think the latest news say about 100 still were trying to be reunited. And then last month, he was the one that uh, held the government accountable for families that were scheduled before his June 26th order and asked the government to submit a proposal for the next steps. And. Um, so uh, kudos to him. You know, he stepped up. Uh, he felt that he had to do something and get involved. And so it just shows you what one person can do, especially a judge. And we're counting on our legal system to help us with all of this. So. Um, and then a judge just ruled also uh, about trying to keep the asylum seekers to remain in Mexico. He said that would not, that, that was not something that should happen. And uh, then we just documented about the migrants that were being held under the bridge uh, there in a holding pen in El Paso. And, and some of you may have seen that when Beto O'Rourke had his uh, rally that day, he was very near to that area. So I think it also helped to raise national awareness about what was going on there in El Paso. And that then, you know, some of that eased a bit. Uh, then the other area there, uh, the U.S. cutting off humanitarian aid to Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. This was right after they had just agreed to continue the aid. So it, it's just, you know, part of that chaos that's going on under all of this. And then our Pentagon has agreed to take a billion dollars from their military personnel account to build part of the border fence. So. And then the next two pages are just, again, uh, many of the, the law, the um, court cases that 
uh, we continue to follow. And then our second, our last two pages are a lot of the things that Tino puts those out as part of some of the city stuff. We try to look at the IWC um, uh, the website, et cetera, and try to you know put things together for you there in one page or you know one page handout, so that if your church or your group or your person can do anything, you have many many opportunities there to help us. So, and I would just ask too, like if you have given our handouts to any specific place, let me know because like we're we're kind of documenting that as well, so that. Um, we can let people know that our work makes a difference to a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you, Sister Susan, and your work does indeed make a lot of difference to a lot of people. If you're making a report somewhere, this is the perfect place to sort of get the latest statistics or the, uh, you say it's not quite up to date, but it's it's more up to date than a lot of things we can find, and we know the date on it. It's printed on the page, so we know when those figures came, uh, you know, were current. Um, Moon is not here. She's probably accompanying someone for a sanctuary update. Let's see. Um, bus Depot. This is what we've just all been very curious about, and Jen has asked Tino to to assist with the bus station report. And where did they go? Just you know. Oh, there he is. Can we give him a standing ovation right now? Oh, yeah. that's right. Tino's going to go first and just let you know what the resource center is and fill in all those and answer all those questions. Sure. Well, um, as many of you who frequented the bus station may know, uh, in the last, in, since last, since last December-ish, yeah, we've had people come in from Eagle Pass kind of without travel plans, and that's been an ongoing issue. And then we started to have <clears throat> really a big influx as of the last week of March, which I don't even know what day we are in today. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people start to show up. Um, and so, you know, the city's agreement was to open up sheltering for any influx. And uh, so that first night, we asked Travis Park if they could help us open up sheltering. And they did very generously at 11.30 at night. Come on over and we, we sheltered some people on that Thursday. The next Friday ended up being uh, almost as, I mean, probably even more chaotic than the, Thursday, than the day before. So by Saturday, our, our city leadership decided that they needed to really um, coordinate efforts to open up a resource center and assist with sheltering. Um, kind of in a bigger, in a bigger, and also like the bigger picture of what, what to, how to assist people who are traveling, you know, during this time. So we've been um, in operation since uh, last Saturday, the one before. March 30th. Is that March 30th? Okay. Since March 30th, we had a, and this is the kind of thing that, you know, the city can do when you ask everybody in the city for help. So Center City Development Operations the Department that deals with the city properties in the downtown core, they identified a site that the city owns that is right next to the bus station in that parking garage. It was a former Quiznos, and that is where it's a city. It's a city property that we're going to try and lease it um, to somebody else. So they are, allow us to use that property. That's first CCDO, laws for them giving us. Um, then the Department of Human Services, um, who really you know they're they're the experts on how to provide services to uh, needy San Antonio residents. Like, they, they coordinate with, with the food bank, they coordinate with Haven for Hope, so they, they know how things get done as far as getting clothing to a place, about getting um, food uh, delivered to a place. So they, they also sent staff and coordinated all of, uh, all of the food bank donations to have hot meals served 
at the resource center. Um, so that was also a really great help. The staffing has been amazing because they do a very good job um, of having people there, making sure that uh, if people want to volunteer, they have a, a person to talk to, kind of give them shifts and, and provide that uh, uh, that kind of support, which is really needed. You know, coordinating support is really it's really helpful. Um, in the beginning, uh, our main idea was that we would help with some travel planning with people, provide them some food, coordinate the sheltering, and of course, Travis Park has been very instrumental in this. They've been very, very generous with offering their space every night. And uh, we've, uh, we've averaged about 60 to 70 people uh, a night being, being sheltered at Travis Park. Um, and, and so that's, that's been really great. They've opened up their doors to us and allowed us to have uh, people there. Our staff there had uh, some, some San Antonio um, fire department uh, uh, officers there so they could do the, the call fire watch uh, overnight. And so that's been really great. We've also tried to with, with the assistance of the Travis Park staff, provide some of the services that people ask for at the church, which are really <coughs> showering. Like, people would want to take a shower. They've been, they've been in um, customs of order, uh, protection custody, where they weren't allowed to take a shower, there's no availability. And so they're released a couple of days after that, and then they come up here, and they're here three or four days in without a shower. So uh, being able to make that happen has also been very helpful when we can make that happen. Um, the other part of it, you know, our, our assistance with uh, travel. Many of the people that are coming to San Antonio um, don't intend to stay here. They're, they're trying to travel somewhere else to be reunited with family members. So a lot of them, all they need is a cell phone to talk to somebody. So we've had some support from our IT department in giving us cell phones to use and also laptops for us to be able to search on the internet for different travel options and printers and all of the, you know, the internet support that we need on location, that's all provided by the city of San Antonio's IT department. Then our Metro Health Department, um, they provided us with, uh, initially it was just EMTs, right? And then they, then they found another space for us right next door, like immediately next door to the, to the former Quiznos, um, and they opened up kind of a makeshift clinic there. And so now we have doctors that volunteer both from Metro Health, UHS and some other people in the community that come in and do the And then we accept donations for the kinds of over the counter medication that people would need because uh, a lot of people are coming, you know, with, with uh, colds and that kind of thing. We've had a few other more serious cases of illness for kids and had um, quite a few kids, especially, referred to the hospital um, one with chicken pox, one with scarlet fever. Um, so there's been a few uh, more serious uh, cases, but we're glad to have doctors there on staff to be able to uh, provide that assistance. Uh, and, and they're there for most of the day. I mean, we, our, our hours, um, we might be shifting this, but they have been 6 to 10, 6 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. So we're basically running like three shifts of people through there every day. Uh, and, our, and our doctors have kind of coordinated their own schedule to do that as well. Um, we've, we've had a lot of support on the, on the medical side um, from donations that were made by uh, St. Mark's for uh, gift cards that provide, that, that, we're, that we're able to use to pay for prescription medication. The people get prescriptions, we're wondering how we're going to pay for them. So we get these Visa prepaid cards and, and also the IWC just, gen just generously donated uh, a, a prepaid Visa card for us to be able to pay for those prescriptions for people and uh, get something in, in their hands so that they can, you know, have some medication before they take their trip. So it has been like a lot of different efforts and a lot of people doing doing work that's assigned out to them, kind of, you know. So we have experts that do these things and it's been really great to watch them just kind of, you know, say, okay, here's our basic need and how, how you go about filling that out and, and making that happen, it's really up to you. One of the things I think that's important to recognize about this effort is that this is not a declared emergency. So this makes a difference for the city because um, in a declared emergency, we get federal and state support for funding. You'd be able to open one of those really big centers and have um, all have it, you know, completely staffed with paid personnel. Since this is not a paid, this is not a paid. I'm sorry, uh, a, a declared emergency. Almost all of the support has been volunteer help. So it. Stepping up with that. 
And so that's kind of why we, we seek uh, donations and we seek volunteers to help. And we do have now volunteer coordinators that all of our volunteers are, are routed through a, a DHS staff member, human services staff member. Uh, and those are Jenny Garcia and, and Joe Van Kuyken. And they are the ones who are now taking people's information and kind of telling them these are our shifts and these are our needs. Um, we also have uh, the food bank is coordinating all of our donations of supplies of food and, and clothing um, so that we don't have our space, our very limited space overwhelmed with all of the generosity of people wanting to donate things. So that's been really wonderful as well. And um, I have a couple of other people. Yes, Goodwill. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at our update. We have, we have two calls a day also. <laughs> Two, uh, two conference calls a day before we get updates. Yeah, that's what we looked at last night somewhere. Yeah, I'm on my phone. Uh, Catholic Charities has been, has been um, amazing. amazing. Yeah, well, they, they, they pay for a lot of tickets. For people, for people who don't have the money, the resources to pay for their tickets to go, especially far. You know, if you're going to New York with four people and you want to leave tomorrow, first of all, there's usually not any tickets available for you. And when you do get them, as, as my volunteer travel coordinating people know, they may be nine, nine hundred, a thousand dollars even on a bus. Uh, so, without the support of, of um, the donations of Catholic Charities, we would be able to get that done. People would just end up being here two, three days, five days, and no way of being able to move on to where they want to be. Um, so, <clears throat> they have been able uh, also coordinate the financial donations for that at Catholic Charities, and then uh, the gift cards are being coordinated by uh, St. Mark's Episcopal Church. We've had, as, as was mentioned before, media coverage of, of um, what we've been doing, um, and also media coverage of what was going on in Eagle Pass with the transit operators there, because we received a lot, of, a lot of, there was a lot of stories being told to us by migrants about how much they were paying to get up here. Um, when we first started to talk to people about this from March 30th <laughs> onwards, for the first week, we heard, I mean, many, many stories of people said they were being charged $100 per person to travel on a van from Eagle Pass to here. So for them, it's like four or five people, it's $400 that they were getting charged. And they basically arrived in San Antonio had no money to go anywhere else or to buy anything else for themselves. And they were, they were sort of shocked to know that you could travel much further for $400 than just from Eagle Pass to San Antonio. So <clears throat> I was very appreciative of our, of our city's um, public affairs department and really taking the lead on, on helping guide the journalists towards that story. And as a result, um, the, the operator alone wasn't shut down. Uh, our recent stories have been, number one, that that particular operator, Aguil Express, charged to people what they say they're gonna charge them, which was around $25 flat fee to bring them inside of 410. That's what they've been charging everyone else in Eagle Pass. And secondly, that there's a new band service that all that charges twenty dollars flat fee, and they all that they also will bring people from Eagle Pass. So uh, those things, at the very least, um, are some positives that that um, we're keeping uh, people from being exploited. And I think that's also very important to recognize. Does anyone have any questions about the resource center? That's wonderful. Just thank you. No, that was that was great. That was incredibly comprehensive. And I just have to say that you know the, the support from DHS in the city has been absolutely incredible. But I just want to remind everybody: this is what the Interfaith Welcome Coalition has been doing, day in and day out, week in and week out. This is just what we've been doing on steroids. Okay, it's the same services, the same populations. The numbers just exploded, and that's what necessitated the city coming in. So if there's a silver lining to this, it has really, there's a big light shining on the work that we always do. Um, so, um, and, and yeah, you've said everything that needs to be said about the Resource Center. The collaboration has just been incredible between the Resource Center and the Interfaith Welcome Coalition. Um, of course, our piece of it is what we always do is when travel arrangements are made for um, families who are over at the Resource Center, the IWC volunteers make sure that, you know, we have a comprehensive list of everybody who is going to the bus station who's going to be traveling on Greyhound, and we make sure that everybody gets over to the bus station for their buses. And the other thing we've been doing is, you know, we still have our families from Dilly 
coming, you know, and when they arrive and we get them taken care of with all the support that we give them, we've been taking them over to the resource center for that hot breakfast, that hot lunch that the food bank has been providing, you know, and also um, taking advantage of all the donations of clothes and shoes and different things. So it's, um, you know, it's just been such a, such a godsend. Um, you know, I think that Sister Susan mentioned the, the transition that's happening at the family detention centers. Carnes, um, are, those numbers are really low. We're getting maybe one to two people from Carnes, and that has transitioned from family to just women. The population in Dilly went down to almost zero. And we were only getting, like the numbers um, today, I mean, anywhere from 40 to 60 individuals. I mean, that's just 20, 20 some families. But the ministry has changed so much. Um, we're getting um, uh, families from multiple locations now throughout the day. And obviously, um, well, the Brownsville bus that brings the releases from McGowan comes three times a day, and sometimes that bus has 20, 30 plus families on it. So we receive them and take care of them. And from different, every time, you, we're doing this constant scanning around the bus station because, you know, everywhere we look, oh, there's another group, there's another family. Um, but the big influx has obviously been the releases from um, Eagle Pass, um, the two vans. Uh, starting, um, it doesn't seem to happen before three usually, but from three o'clock on up until 10 o'clock, there's just wave after wave of people who are being dropped off. Um, from Eagle Pass, and and what um, so we IWC has been staffing the bus station every evening until 10 o'clock, so it's just been you know a tremendous um, effort by our volunteers, and we um, you know we greet those people, we figure out what they need, do they have tickets, do they have resources to buy tickets? Most of them do not. Most of them come with the clothes on their back, and so um, uh, we will uh, take them over to the resource center um, uh, at that point and they'll start working on travel plans and, um, and overnight hospitality. And that reminds me, I wanted to say a word about, about Travis Park United Methodist. It's not just what they're doing now with overnight hospitality. I think you are all aware that they have given us space, a basement room for all of our supplies, a second floor room for all of our overflow, and we keep overflowing and overflowing. And so, you know, and, and when we overflow the bus station, you know, the days when we have um, uh, 100 to 200 people at the bus station, I'll just give them a call and it's like, yeah, bring your, bring your late departures over here. And, you know, we take them to the playroom, we take them to the basement, so, so, so Travis Park is just an extension of our WC. And I, you know, I, I don't really keep track of numbers. I mean, that's Jane's job, but I always like to give you uh, uh, in the month of March, just to give you an idea, we handed out 2,206 backpacks um, because of all the different diverse populations who are coming to the bus station. And if they need backpacks, if they need meals, if they need um, uh, maps, we, we every, every, everybody, they're, they're, they're our families, we take care of everybody who arrives at that bus station. And Sister Denise is back today. <laughs> So I think that not she's just arriving here. Yeah. Now there's any questions? Any questions? Does the volunteer supply where it needs to be, or is there still a serious shortage of volunteers? I think there's always, I don't want to say shortage, there's always a need for volunteers. I mean, people have been, have been stepping up, and you know, we've managed to have at least two, sometimes more volunteers um, in the evening. Um, the one thing we don't know is, is this our new normal? I mean, how long um, we're going to have to sustain this effort? Um, you know, because it is a challenge to staff the bus station from, you know, 9.30 in the morning until 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. So, yeah, the need for volunteers. Even for volunteers who are not bilingual? Uh -huh. Pardon? If volunteers are not bilingual, do you still need them? Yes. Yeah, we always have to have at least one Spanish speaker. Um, uh, at the bus station, um, uh, and 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 um, I, ideally someone who has had some experience at the bus station. Um, but but yeah, we're really putting a, a call out for volunteers. And and um, yeah, I wanted to mention Clemencia Prieto 
Um, uh, she's, she's been like a, a force of nature um, covering the evening um, hours. Questions? Director of the San Antonio Department of Human Services is Melody Woolsey. No. Melody Woolsey. And, and her two assistants, directors, are also, they've been outstanding. They, they're kind of our point people, like, they're, they're on call, each one alternates every day of the week. So, Edward Gonzalez and Jessica Villalina. Okay, Colleen, Colleen Bridger, who's our, our assistant city manager now, and she oversees Human Services, and I think also um, uh, Metro Health. So she was a former head of Metro Health, and now she's oversees both departments. And she's, she's really been the one who said, okay, this is what we're gonna do, and we're gonna do it right. And Tino also has been yeah, there. Of course. <laughs> I, I think they, they stepped up, because when I showed up that one Thursday, and it was chaos, they said, we better accept that guy's support. <laughs> This sounds very trite. The, the shoelace problem. The shoelace problem. We don't. We're not getting shoelaces in as donations. And uh, we've got several gentlemen coming in without any shoelaces. Sounds very simple. Could we get Dilly to give up to give us the shoelaces that, that they have confiscated in the back? <laughs> <laughs> he steal them out. That's not I think the shoelaces were confiscated. Much, much earlier. Much so if we can find out where the shoelaces are, otherwise we need to add that to our We we actually do get a pretty generous supply of shoelaces okay. donated. So yeah, and that is a critical item. Nothing trite about it. The families that are coming from Eagle Pass, how long are they on the Mexico side typically? And what's their typical they, they're never detained, I guess, but how long are they in a limbo period, maybe on the Mexico side, if you know? Yeah, I don't, don't really ask all, you know, we don't have like a systematic way of asking those kinds of questions. We don't really even ask how long they're in detention on, on the U.S. side. I mean, like, you know, I go to ask sometimes, it could be a conversation with people. And some people were, were part of the, the caravan that arrived in Piedras Negras and were at the albergue and uh, were there for a significant amount of time <laughs> waiting uh, to come in at the port of entry. And other people were more recent arrivals. So, <laughs> They didn't stay as long, you know. I've, I've heard stories of people who said that they basically got from Guatemala to Piedras Negras in a week, and other people who said they've been walking and taking the bus. I mean, sorry, taking the, the top of the train ride for two months. Yeah. So it, it does vary, but almost all of them uh, are coming with, with small kids, so not a very comfortable journey either, which way dangerous for the kids. If, if this is the new normal, how do we make this? kind of partnership with the city and everyone sustainable. Yeah, you know, I think the, the most important thing that we've discussed, <laughs> that the first step would be finding a partner who could do overnight sheltering, you know, um, on a consistent basis and figure out how that can be done um, um, with somebody who would, you know, possibly be uh, like contracting with the city to do that. So, you know, the, that kind of that kind of arrangement I think is probably the best, the, the, the thing we'd be seeking first. Um, long term, I know there's there's been de several different initiatives by nonprofits to um, open up temporary sheltering spaces around town. Um, so if there's a way to coordinate support for any of those initiatives, would be great. I, mean, I, know, I know John's talked about it before, and Bryce has talked about it also in the past, um, and Catholic Charities has also talked about it too. So I mean, you know, there's at least three people who, three organizations who have talked about. Um, Expanding the capacity of overnight sheltering for this for this particular group of people, um, you know we have our, our our usual homelessness support services, but you know it would be adding people to the courtyard basically at Haven uh, to have people stay um, at those facilities. So that that's one important component. Um, we don't know about the, the the need for the kind of support the resource center provides. There is another. Um, national organization called Travelers Aid, and they do this kind of thing in other cities. They have talked to the executive director. She sent me an application of kind of their guidebook. One of the things that they require for some... Yes, 
one of the things that they do require travelers aid is they, they partner with 501c3 entities who are interested in providing these kinds of services. I think nationally, what, they, what she told me is that a lot of the support comes from uh, the United Way. Um, so it would, it would be just identifying somebody who's interested in doing that kind of work and then joining with the national organization who does it. Um, that both Dallas and Houston have Travelers Aid offices, but San Antonio does not. Um, so if anybody has an, a 501c3 that's interested in that kind of work, yeah. Um, there's actually a, a meeting scheduled on Monday with all of the players who are involved in the resource center in the city, and, and it's deciding moving forward. <clears throat> so, um, one of the things about what I've been told about, right? yes, the, the Red Cross support um, usually is accessed only when there's a disaster. So the declared disaster part is what's missing in having those resources directed to this particular effort. Over here. Uh, one of my concerns uh, when we started getting such an influx from processing centers as opposed to detention centers. In processing centers, the families are not offered vaccinations. And we already have a problem brewing in our country with our own citizens. Um, not being vaccinated against the communicable diseases. And I was wondering, having listened to the strong health component we seem to have at the resource center, would there be any chance of setting up a vaccination program for those people who don't have documents that show that their kids and themselves have had the Vaccinations against standard I, I think that's an important question and probably one that's better addressed by people at Metro Health because they do, they're more specialists in immunization. The one thing that it's important to remember with the people that are at the resource center is they're usually not there for very long, number one. They're not there for very long. You know, it's like 24 to 48 hours. People are in, people are out. Um, number two, um, and it's probably true more for Mexico than I don't know for Central American countries. In Mexico, people tend to get back vaccinated uh, pretty uniformly. So, but our people aren't coming from Mexico. Right, and I don't I don't know what the what the policies are in those countries. I think they're similar. And you don't and what you don't want to do is over vaccinate people either, because if they over vaccinate people, you don't want to to, to keep giving kids shots, right? If they've already had them, that's what I've been told about vaccination, and, and that's it. Right? Um, um, other conversations I've had with, with immunization department is that they don't they they are concerned about um, vaccinating people who've already been vaccinated because that's a that's a problem. So I mean you know some of these things if they're longer term concerns they're best addressed when the person arrives at their destination city and they can have the ability to get records to them instead of when they're in this transitional moment where they're like have a hundred things on their mind and. You know, vaccinating their kids is probably one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things that's been a great collaborative in ordinary times uh, has been with Raises, their folks at the bus station to explain the next steps in the process, which is so important. And uh, when I was there Friday night, um, the Raises people were doing the things that we do from IWC because it was desperate. But I'm wondering if we've been able, if they've been able to continue. Um, and do that kind of service and maybe other people add to that service because, you know, the crisis of getting here and all that's happening is important, but boy, that next step and understanding the importance of it and being familiar with it is also extremely important. So I don't know if that's been able to continue by rises or by other people. I mean, people pay attention no matter how conflicted and frightened they seem, they pay attention to those folks because they know this is vital to their survival here. Right, the RAISIS volunteers are a constant presence at the bus station, and they do that legal counseling. They've done it before, they're, they're doing it during, and they'll do it after. American Gateways has also stepped up. Both, both of those organizations are doing legal counseling. But yeah, that, that, that's just a part of the bus station ministry that works so well. Yeah, we seem to have a lot of legal volunteers who are in town right now, um, and 
so we've had a lot of requests to come and do talks. That, yet last night we had, or well, a couple nights we actually had, a group of um, law students under supervision of their professor from St. Louis University Law School. Okay. So they came and did some. We've had a couple of other private attorneys uh, that are associated with the local immigration bar come in and do these same kind of talks. So it's been nice, you know, I think people really want to be able to be involved, and I think it gives people a, a good opportunity to kind of, um, I don't know, like touch the earth in a way, and actually feel like you are there. So that it is, it's valuable. Sometimes our eyes have to be open to the obvious. Um, Tuesday, we had two of the young women from cars in a 50 passenger bus dropped off at the airport. And Barbara lent me a couple of packs, backpacks from them. And one was a young Cubana who was lucky she hadn't been shipped back to the island because Mexico was shipping all the Cubanos back to the island. And I gave her the backpack. She took out the bear, the little bear. And she wouldn't let it go, but she kind of broke down. She hadn't had touch, tactile touch on her war and who knows how long. And I never really realized that, that while we take care of these children, these women have been through hell. And uh, just those little things that we do, just God. Yes, do you also provide uh, some type of spiritual support for uh, People coming in. So um, I see Anne over here, very quietly in the back. <coughs> Anne has been uh, Anne has been very instrumental in, in coordinating some efforts to have people come and visit in the evenings um, to to provide spiritual support. And I think it's been a pretty uh, a great comfort to uh, people that are there, um, even if it's just someone to sit and talk with with people about their experiences, you know, see people who've gone from just kind of sitting there, staring at the walls, being nervous, to actually having a conversation, you know, smiles on their faces. Um, you know, parents who are usually pretty much very concerned about where they're going to be and where they're going to take their kids. And the kids are off, you know, in the corner playing with balls and coloring crayons and all that kind of thing. But, you know, the parents, uh, they haven't had that really the opportunity to talk to anybody else other than their other fellow travelers. So it has been it has been uh, a tremendous service. Um, I'd like to be able to coordinate that uh, probably a little bit. <clears throat> I don't know if we have a point person for that. Maybe it should still be yeah for with, through Jenny but, and Jenny and Joe. But yeah. No, I was just um, uh, going to acknowledge the efforts of the Interfaith Welcome Coalition and our volunteer coordinator Carolina Barrera um, uh, and. And, and Denise reached out to her, and she put together a pool of of, um, uh, of of pastors and priests and ministers and sisters who were willing to do um, the spiritual support. <clears throat> and and I, that's something that could very easily be sustainable. Yeah. yeah. Just just to add to that, that Sister Elizabeth Ann sent out uh, a note, an email to all of the sisters in the archdiocese asking if they'd like to have spiritual accompaniment. And the other day when I was there, uh, three sisters arrived, and they just went around and started talking. So yes. Second question is: Do we need provided for those who are willing to participate? No, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, obviously the city can't. Yeah, but I suppose if someone were to come and offer it, that would be Are there any families arriving here that want that don't have a, a need to go somewhere else that want to settle here in San Antonio or Texas or don't really know where they want to settle society? That is really rare. There, I, I think I ran across one guy today who said, I'm going to stay here in San Antonio. I was like, all right. <laughs> and said, How much does it cost to rent a place? <laughs> really depends. Keep on going. Right. Um, but yeah, typically it's very rare because people come and, and they know they're going to arrive with 
somebody that they know, and and that's what we try and figure out when we're when we're talking to them. You know, where they when they're figuring out where they're going to go from San Antonio is where you have someone who can take you in for a little bit and help help get on your feet. Um, so that's been typically what we're what we're seeing. So it sounds like know where they work, they come and they say, I want to go to Los Angeles. Yes, right. that is exactly so what happens. Is there something that they may arrange with some of the other fans that you're thinking? Or are they going to lie to Los Angeles? No, no. Well, Typically they're people, they're they just need to get their, to get a phone that works. What happens is a lot of people have, they bring phones with them, but the phones will work in, it, through Mexico, but once they get to the U.S., our, our network, our cell phone networks won't allow them. So they need to get some place where they can make a phone call or use WhatsApp. You know, WhatsApp, get a Wi-Fi, and they can start WhatsApping people here and there. And they talk to them and say, I'm here in San Antonio, Texas. Or it's like, where's San Antonio, Texas? Um, <laughs> then we start to talk from there about how they're going to get there. And, and a lot of people, you know, they just, they just need to have an ability to get a hold of somebody, you know. And then also it's important for some of, you know, the person that's been kind of in communication with them throughout the trip to know that they got somewhere. <laughs> Because it does happen where people get separated, and we still we see that, you know, here and there. Um, as, as anybody who starts doing this kind of work, you start to get involved in all the stuff that happens in these journeys, and you're like, oh boy. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's important to have the ability to talk to somebody. Right. You know, uh, the volunteer work I do at the, the airport, <laughs> we give out a little piece of paper that has some emergency phone numbers on. One of the phone numbers is my phone number. Uh -huh. and, uh, but it, it, it goes to the point that you're making is that once the folks get to where they're going, the destination, whether it's Miami or Charlotte or New York, a lot of times uh, they've been so overwhelmed with information, they're a little confused about what next steps they have to do, whether it's reporting to uh, 10 days on the Brigette or they actually have questions regarding the uh, tribunal. And uh, I get a call on that. What I've been doing is uh, looking up Catholic Charities or some other pro bono uh, legal aid in Bakersfield, California, for example, and passing that information. I would su suggest that maybe we ought to consider some type of, on this follow-up, uh, either uh, us opening up an 800 number that we operate or, or something to provide that last piece of information on what to do next. Because you know, they're under an order of deportation. If they don't file 589, and if they don't go report to their uh, meeting, ICE could come out with the uh, enforcement removal operations and, and they will ask the question, who else is here and who has papers? So there's collateral damage on those kind of follow up just a thought. I don't mind taking the calls or anything. Thanks to my good friend Jim. I'm Fred, have you, seen, have you seen the, the pink sheets that are yeah. uh, yeah. No, I have not yeah, seen they, the um, th th That addresses exactly what you're talking about in the sense that... I'll it, follow up. I'll get it there. I'll yeah, I mean, it really summarizes next step. You know, ice, ice check-in, calling for a court date. So they make sure that... Yeah, um, it, may, it may be. I think it's just the element of calling somebody and saying, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, sis Sister Denise actually put her number <laughs> on the map sheet, so um, okay, we need to we need to see. We need to move on. Don't you think? <clears throat> one last question. Did you have one last question? Well, I was just going to say, at one point years ago, we had talked about the possibility of having those rubber bracelets with the one eight hundred number on, because they have so many papers, and the papers get lost and shuffled, and there's so much information. But if you give them all a, a little rubber bracelet with a, with a one eight hundred number, as long as somebody's manning the number, that's a really good place for them to keep it. So. Thank you. Right, thank you. so proud of our city and, and, and all of you and all of our volunteers too. You can, you can help people or you can arrest them for peeing on the sidewalk. Same amount of money and effort and time. Maybe. Close. <clears throat> um, just quickly on the airport, we had a meeting with um, the new airport duty manager and um, 
Deborah Achen from ICE, and uh, let's see, Joe Pendleton, overnight shelter person, and uh, David King, one of our daily team leaders last week, and I feel like it was a very fruitful conversation. We have friends where we don't think we have friends. I was so um, pleased when Deborah H. told the airport <laughs> uh, duty manager, if these people weren't here, you would have to hire someone to do what they do. And that's very true. That's very true. Um, Let's see, Jane is not here today, but we all know she's been making millions of backpacks. <laughs> Overnight hospitality, Joe and John, would y'all like to? <coughs> Eric, uh, can I give you a little time? Would you like to tell us about Travis Park, or is there anything you want to add? I mean, I'll let you do it after these guys, but I think that's something I should have asked you. Well, the month of March was kind of normal. Uh, we had, we sheltered during the month of March up until March 30th, we sheltered a total of uh, 48 families. Uh, in a combination of uh, La Casa de Maria y Marta, Casa Nacho, uh, our overnight host families and a few hotels. Then March 30th, everything changed. And uh, the first night that we saw, this is more than we could handle among our, our shelters and our families. We had, we were expecting 40 something, but it turned out to only be 21. Um, and uh, Madison Square Presbyterian uh, opened its doors to house those, those 21 that night. Uh, and then the next night, as I think they said, uh, the uh, uh, Travis Park uh, opened its doors for the for the next night, and then the city stepped in uh, in its wonderful way. Uh, so, John. And ever since the city stepped in, we've gone on vacation to Borneo. <laughs> so actually, we've enjoyed the the high life. Um, <laughs> So, so grateful for the organization and so grateful for the response. It feels like this goes back three years that this has laid the groundwork for this very week. And I'm just so proud of our city and so proud that IWC has forged this relationship with the city and so glad that Tina didn't leave us. You guys remember that? We love you, Tina. questions about overnight hospitality so truly uh, the casas have been closed since uh, since March 30th uh, we're taking a breather uh, so any questions okay Eric Vogt Reverend Eric Vogt is uh, the minister at Travis Park United Methodist Um, I just want to thank all of you. It's, it's um, as John said, this is a continuing partnership, and I, I think it's really beautiful when we all bring what we can. And I'm grateful that um, the location, the proximity, the space that we have at Travis Park can be a resource. I hope you'll keep talking to us about other dreams you might have. Um, you know, we've been, we've had a little bit of conversation of are, are there ways that we could um, adapt our facilities to be a better resource. Um, over the long haul, and so interested to have those kind of conversations with any of you. Um, yeah, mostly I just want to say thank you, and um, let me know, or uh, I, ha I have to um, say our, our associate pastor, Gavin Rogers, has been a big part of coordinating. He's the one who's on those twice a day um, conference calls, and so, um, yeah, thanks uh, again, Tino, and, and everyone that's, it, it really feels beautiful to me. It feels like this is what um, the reign, the kingdom of God is um, is about, and so um, I'm excited to do that more uh, with all of you. Um, thank you to Carrie Kirtley. She's back here, uh, who's been helping to provide um, food, right, um, uh, along with folks from um, from Travis Park. And um, like I said, Gavin and I are available to talk. If there are more things that we can do. So, thank you.
Okay, Terry, do we have some reports from collaborators? Collaborators come to the front. Yes, thank you. I couldn't remember how we did this. I don't usually do this far. If you have a collaborator's report, come on up here and we'll just let you pop up and say what you have to say and uh, move on back. Did we have an essay stands? Yes, right here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniela. I'm with the Migrant Center for Human Rights, and I have really great news for you. Uh, the reason why me, the legal assistant, is here and not Sarah Ramey, the executive director, is because she is in D.C. right now, talking to members of Congress. Uh, right, what's happening right now is they have the AILA, sorry, it's English second language. Um, that's the American Immigration Lawyers Association. They're having an event in D.C. where they're basically, uh, these attorneys from all over the country are going to talk to members of Congress about specific issues, what they're seeing on site, what's happening, and basically telling them what has to happen in policy. So some of the goals that they have for, and specifically Sarah's goals, is to talk to them about the processing delay right now that we have. Um, so basically, people are waiting for a long, long time just to get to get to meet the judge. And a lot of the reasons for this is because there's not enough judges out there um, that are attending these cases. And also, sometimes what we see happening is when people are in detention, we work specifically for those of you who are new to organization, we work in a specific offering legal services to people in detention center at Pearsall. That's only 65 miles away from San Antonio, so right around the corner. And uh, we, what we see happening, some of the concerns that were raised was uh, the medical conditions and the sanitary conditions. People there are getting sick. And so they, they're put in quarantine and they can't meet their judge. So then their, their court hearing gets delayed. And this just sums up uh, and that adds up to the already growing processing delay for their court hearings. So this is an issue that she wants to bring uh, to the policy, uh, uh, to the people at Congress. Uh, another issue is, Judicial independence. So what does this mean? Uh, basically, the immigration judges are appointed by the Attorney General under the Department of Justice. So this means that they are basically under an agenda. They need, they need to follow what the executive tells them to do. And that is, so for example, if our current president is saying that they have a cap on the amount of immigrants that you can let in, they have to do that because that's their boss. And you do what your boss tells you to do. So this is something that has to be taken down out of the executive, and that's something that they want to raise awareness on. And third, due process at the border. As we've seen from the news, people are being returned, uh, are being denied due process at the border. They're not even being able to apply for asylum, and this is a huge issue because if you're not able, even able to explain why you're here in the first place and go through the due legal process, then pretty much the, it shows you how the, the whole system is uh, not functioning correctly. So uh, this is something that they, she wants to raise awareness, awareness on. She's talking to right now, actually, at this time, at point in time, talking to members of Congress about this. So um, that, that's, that's for what's happening right now. Uh, some of the community events uh, that we ha we've had yesterday uh, with the ECO Center uh, from the Alamo College. Um, <laughs> we were there yesterday. There was a movie screening of the movie Icebox which tells a story of a boy named Oscar and how basically he is detained uh, at the border and how he is unable to face the immigration process. And it just calls attention to the, the, the importance of, of, of organizations like the Migrant Center, so giving people the opportunity to understand the legal process and be represented and be able to explain their case to the judge uh, in a more effective way. So uh, it's a fantastic movie. I know we have some people from Trinity and UTSA. Uh, I would love to talk to you guys about maybe organizing another screening to reach more people, reach members of the community, engage the student community there. Uh, I think it would be a nice opportunity. And just um, a few more uh, announcements. Uh, right now, the community that we're working on, we have a few cases from Angola, uh, and cases from uh, Republic of the Congo. And so if anyone knows of anyone who speaks Kikongo, <laughs> uh, please hit me up. We also have someone that speaks Kiche. 
So if you know anyone who might be able to, to help us with that, we would really appreciate it. And any questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much for your time. I forgot to uh, um, remind our uh, collaborators that our announcements are two minutes, and I hate to do that on the second person, <laughs> but, but I'm going to have to do that. Hi everyone, I'm Nate Broder and I run the Raise His Bond Fund. Um, this looks like the one we submitted last Brand month. Um, but basically, um, what we have this month, if you know people who've been affected by the raids in North Texas, it was the largest raid in over a decade in Allen, Texas, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, our attorneys from our Dallas and Fort Worth offices were on the ground doing um, legal intakes and our bond fund has been working around the clock to get people out of jail as fast as possible. Um, so I had some numbers um, that I sent, but um, but it wasn't on that slide, so I can look them up and send them out to the listserv. So if you know anybody in the DFW area who's also working with people who might have been affected by those workplace raids, there they are. Um, please give one of those numbers a call, and those are our legal offices in Dallas who are doing um, free consults for people who've been affected, and then if they're bond eligible, uh, we really wanna pay that bond as fast as we can. Um, and then our bus station update, we talked for a long time about that. What we need is weekend volunteers, so if you know any Spanish-speaking uh, volunteers who can volunteer through our legal aid project at the bus station, um, let us know. And um one of the successes that we had yesterday we met mariella who coordinates that project for us she met somebody who'd been released from Carnes, whose husband was in joe corley detention center in houston and he was sitting there with a bond for twelve thousand dollars and so because we were we had that legal aid project of mariella's work at the bus station she referred him to our bond fund and we're getting that bond paid on tuesday and so that we know there's other just another day. Uh, we know there's hundreds of cases like that, so it's really important that we're there every day, including weekends. So if you are able to come on weekends and help us out, we would love that. And uh, you can email volunteer at raicestexas.org. Thank Hello. I'm with Immigrant Hope. My name is Carla Hannett. I do live here in San Antonio, but our um, organization is based out of uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're part of the Evangelical Free Church of America. We're a nonprofit uh, organization that works with uh, the DOJ. We offer the the 40-hour trainings for people that are not attorneys, or I mean, attorneys can obviously come as well. Uh, we offer these trainings three to four times a year in different areas in the country. We do have, or in the United States, sorry. We, uh, we have one a year here in San Antonio. Our next one's coming up at the end of the month in, in Minneapolis. If you want information on that, I can still get you that. But the other thing we're also doing is we're looking at um, the possibility and of course hearing all of these things that we've heard uh, of starting a center here in, in uh, San Antonio that would house a, our, our legal center, but also open it up to some of the things that we've just been talking about today. So I, I've got, I would love to hear from people or get contact information. I have some brochures if you're interested, but uh, go to our website. It gives you more of the, the ideas and things that we do. And I forgot to say them. One of the other things we do is we walk through a church who's interested in opening a resource center in their church. We have seven of them open in the United States and three in the process of waiting in the piles with a whole lot of paperwork. So uh, we're gonna have 10 pretty soon and we'd love to talk to you about that if that's in something that would be something you'd like to do. I'm just going to say, don't run out too soon at the end of the meeting because we do want to talk with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I'm still Tom Hager. I'm still flunking retirement. The last three months I was here asking for your help. Today I'm here to say thank you for your help. 
three and a half weeks ago, 17 folk from the state of Maine came and learned from you, served with you, Travis Park Church both put them up and put up with them. Um, and what you did to their lives and their home church has been transformative. You dropped this little pebble in a pond. The state of Maine's biggest newspaper last Sunday had a major op-ed about you and what you're doing. The elected state rep, who was a part of that team of 17, had a four-page major piece sent to her constituents and all of the elected people in the state of Maine. There was a major uh, news article about you in one of the other weekly newspapers. And at First Parish in Yarmouth, um, the Sunday when they all got home and were still numb and dopey and not clear about how to tell their story, the congregation received a special offering. There's a check for $721 on its way. And so you have touched lives. One of the things I do better than recognizing old friends in a room like this is forget their names. And so I can't thank you personally for the gifts you shared, but thank you personally for the gifts you shared. And to make it tangible, Presbyterians do sacraments in lots of funny ways. And so to your co-chairs, a tiny token, a sacrament of our gratitude, it's a little thing that simply says, those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the person doing it. <laughs> to get an office. <laughs> Matt? It's our speaker next month. Next month. Oh, Matt is our speaker next month. Good. I was afraid I just saw him leave. Uh, Justice for our neighbors. Matt Lovemeyer will be here next month. Any other uh, additional information or questions or... My gosh, so much has happened this morning. And I'm really glad that you were all here to be a part of it, to hear what's been happening, to add what you've been doing to the mess <laughs> that we're all experiencing this month. Yes, Tina? I was looking to see if somebody else was here that could answer my question. What's happening to the men that were coming to the bus station, I mean, to the uh, airport? There were men with babies, little children, and the numbers have gone down. Does anybody know what happened to the men at Carnes? Were, did, they, did I hear they went to Florida somewhere? Or they were transferred? They got their population down to zero. They, their population is down to zero, and it's now women at Carnes instead of, instead of fathers. In order to transform more women. Yes. So, where do you think that? We Does don't know. someone know where the men and children from Carnes were transferred to? They weren't transferred, they were released. Oh, they were released. But men that are coming in now, where did they go? I don't know. They're not being paid. So, you know, why do you think somebody's They're not being paid, that's why you're seeing them. They're not being paid. Out of port so. roads, release the port roads. That's how we get people here. Mm -hmm. How do we clean down? Oh, we need five microphones, don't we? <laughs> Terry? <laughs> oh, um, the announcements that you've heard from our collaborators are available all month, and they, this tiny CC, number is where you can access them and it will be does it, it it will be included on uh our next email to you too so that you can link to there anything else thank you very much have a good night uh, volunteer <laughs> if you uh, if you're a volunteer of ours you're welcome to come <laughs> volunteer at the bus station
There'll be a training tonight.